Welcome to Syntax. We got one today for you. How to build a website or an app. We got a really good question from someone. I'll just read it real quick because it gives you kind of an idea of what we're talking about. Is hi guys, love the show. A question for both of you. What is your actual workflow when developing application? For example, say you're building a list of podcast episodes for a podcast website, hypothetically. <laughs> Something we've done. What are the low-level steps you follow? Do you use a design, um, Figma, pen and paper, or something else? Do you wire up the API and first output um, the data, or do you use mock dummy data and then wire it up later? Uh, do you work in components in isolation, or do you build them in place? I'm keen to hear about the effective workflows. I thought this was awesome. This is the entire show. Um, <laughs> just how do you build a website, right? There's There's so many different moving parts to it, and not only like what do you use, but like what's your approach? How do you even think about choosing these types of things? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, with me, as always, is Mr. Scott Talinsky. How are you doing today, Scott? Hey, I'm doing super good hanging out here. It is snowing like crazy. We got like a foot of snow just out of nowhere. Yeah, that's, just just shocking. That's wild me to me because you like... Your Instagram story is always hilarious. It's like yeah. you're sitting in your backyard watching a movie, and then like a day later, you've got a foot of snow. <laughs> we we had a party like last Sunday outside. I was yeah. wearing shorts all evening, shorts at, at night, 9 o'clock. So it was like warm enough that you could be just, you know, chilling in shorts, and then a week later, you get dumped on by snow. Of course, a couple days right before Halloween. So that means I got to go trick-or-treating tonight with... <laughs> What the? Oh, yeah. Like it is like so cold out west. I'm gonna be bundled up. It's like the absolute worst. It, besides, it, the only way it could get worse for trick or treating is if it was raining right now. But uh, you know, <laughs> the kids are gonna go nuts, so it doesn't matter. Oh man. Um. So speaking of building the website, uh, when you do build your website, you're gonna goof it up. You're gonna Ooh, screw yeah. something up. You're gonna some sort of bug that you cannot figure out because the user is using the website wrong. and You never thought that that would ever possibly happen. Uh, and for that, you're going to need Century to help you figure out what's going on with that. We had one of the bugs on the new Syntax website where I was looking at it and I thought, I don't see how this would ever possibly happen. I don't see how anyone would ever get into the situation where they could click this button and they were not in the, th in the state that they were. And uh, we used the Century uh, session replay and boom, I was able to see exactly how they did. Also, I got to see them get frustrated and leave the website. So yeah. check it out, century.io. Uh, and are, were we given the coupon code still there, Scott? Um, I have been. Yeah, let's let's do it. Uh, century.io and use coupon code tasty treat two months for free. All right. So how do you build a website, Scott? <laughs> yeah, you know what? For me... It I think this is going to differ from person to person. And and I think that's an important distinction because we all come with our own, I don't want to say baggage, but our own background of yeah. where we learned, what we I learned. I got baggage. How, yeah, I got baggage. I, in fact, I need new baggage. I've been shopping for luggage, that's for sure. Just about what, what type of specific background we have. And if you think about it, it all kind of starts with the very first visual side of things you know some people would want to go into wire framing and and really understand the flow of a website before they get into it other people want to get right into that code i'm gonna get it right into the code kind of person mostly because i have adhd but also because i'm probably the most comfortable prototyping things out quickly in code and seeing it kind of form in a browser other people are going to go straight to a, a tool that allows them to start to see things visually in a way like wireframing tools or uh, maybe even get right into design tools and skip the wireframing tools um, so you know it, it all depends on what your background is but also the best way that you can start to visualize something coming together right yeah it's it's Kind of funny because building a website, much like learning how to do websites, is it's not linear, meaning that like it's not a set of nice, clean, crisp steps where you do one one thing next after another. And um, the larger the team you're on, the more that actually does need to be linear, the more you actually need a yeah. system that is uh, has rules and, and is a little bit more rigid um, so that you can do things a little bit more smoothly rather than sort of just bouncing around. Uh, from thing to thing. So let's start with the the design uh, that you have 
there. So you can you can pick up a design tool, um, or you can just start start winging it. Like Scott says, you can start winging it right away in in CSS. I tend myself, I tend to fiddle around in Figma uh, to get a sort of look and feel for for all my websites. So I'll get in there. I'll get the color scheme down. I'll get sort of the layout down. I'll build like the the major things like headings, text, buttons, uh, cards, all of like kind of those look because I, I feel like it's a bit faster to do that in a Figma tool um, mm-hmm. to play around with things. And then once I'm like pretty happy, like if you were to look at any of the designs that I've done for any of my websites, they're nowhere near a polished website layout or a bunch of nice clean components um it's just kind of like a, all right I, I think i can see what i'm doing there i do the same thing with recipes when i'm cooking i'll read three or four recipes and then i just go all right i get it you know i get it and i'm mm-hmm. just gonna go wing it and for a lot of people they don't like that because they'd rather just follow every single step and do it linearly but i can just kind of say all right i kind of feel like i know what i'm doing here it'll probably deviate once i get into the code but at least I'm on the right track and I have something that I can work towards because when you're trying to make it look good and fuss with the code, it's a little bit frustrating because then you got two things battling against you. Yeah. And and we kind of touched on this in the episode about the new syntax website itself, but I personally can get right into building a design system out and then letting the design kind of come together that way. So yeah. instead of designing and then going from design to website, I'm like, I'm working on the system. I'm working on grabbing a font scale, grabbing some colors, grabbing some palettes, and then just tossing things out. And I think that does limit <laughs> limit my designs in a very specific way. Um w- because you don't necessarily get that playfulness that you can get with Figma, moving things around, dragging things around, getting that kind of quick feedback loop. You're more or less working on the structure. And if you were to, I, I'm sure I have some screenshots of this somewhere, but like if you were to look at some of the first versions of the syntax site, it is apparent that it is like a system based design and not a like creative based design. And I I think that is definitely limiting, which is one of the reasons why I like working with designers so much. But if you can't work with designers, it's kind of about knowing your limitations, right? You kind of have to know where you're at in that scheme. Okay, I'm building a website. What is my level of design background? Am I comfortable with design? All right, if you answer not at all, I'm not comfortable with design. You want to get the most turnkey, already pre-designed for you thing out there and then just make it look nice. Designed by engineers is not cute. Um, That's like (laughs) an aesthetic that like, I I swear, I was on Hacker News the other day and there was like an open source YouTube alternative. And everybody's like, oh, this is so neat. And you click on it and it looked like dog beep. It looked awful. And I, I, I just commented, I was like, you know, they could have used a design system or pre-made anything and it would look a lot better. And they're like, why don't you fork it and do it yourself? It's like, okay, well, I'm just, you know, that's positive feedback right there. I think if you, if you're design, if you're an engineer straight up and you don't know design, always just use a fully, fully designed pre-made thing that you can. And then, elaborate from there if you are a little bit comfortable take that next step use something like tailwind or open props something that gives you more hand holding in the aspects of things to build out a more standardized system if you're very comfortable with design yeah go just straight up css to the dome you know don't add anything else in there and, and go nuts with it maybe use some post css or some helper libraries here or there or whatever uh me personally uh, it, it all just depends on on what level of comfort you have in being able to make things look nice yourself. I was just going to shout out uh, the Brad Frost episode on design systems. So syntax.fm forward slash 682. Man, I love being able to give out those URLs to people. Um, the short ones, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so nice because you can just say, go to syntax.fm forward slash 682. You know, also another thing, I never we never talked about this when we talked about the new website is if you listen on Spotify or iTunes, um, is it on iTunes as well? No, it's not. It's just Spotify. This is It's a limitation of the thing. But if you often will shout out an episode and you can go on Spotify and search that number. Like you could go on, on Spotify and search 
syntax 682 and, and that episode will pop up. But now there is a button on the syntax website for each episode, which will click you through to Spotify. And there's some hmm. sauce we put in the URL that will hopefully in, in every single case show you the episode we're talking about in Spotify, because that's sometimes it disconnects. Like, okay, I see it on the website, but like, I don't want to listen to it on the website. I want to listen to it on Spotify. So we have that now. So check it out. Yeah. But can we go shorter, Wes? <laughs> can we go shorter? Oh, uh, Scott just uh, sent me a short domain name that's available. I don't know. Syntax.fm forward slash 682. That's, that, that, that's pretty yeah, easy know. to say. We could. <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're I'm not going to say it because yeah. a couple of you <laughs> listeners like to jack things once we mention them, so we can't say it. Yeah, I'm, but, I'm sending. I'm just sending some links here. It is. It's pretty attractive looking. So um, that's true. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll think about that one, folks. We'll we'll keep you, we'll keep you in the loop if we decide to go with it. Yeah. Next next thing we have here for choosing is like you need to choose what you're going to build your front end in here. And maybe I should outline all of the, the major topics we're hitting on this episode. You have the design, you have your choosing your front end components, you have your data database, possibly CMS. Um, you have your back end languages, testing, hosting, deployment, uh, and then whatever else we sort of stumble upon. So let's talk about like, choosing a front end like are you going to template it out in something and likely yeah yeah likely you're going to pick something that will aid you in templating out and turning it into html at the end of the day because there's very few people that are going to code up a header and then create a new html page and then you have to copy paste the header onto the other one right or maybe put some frames in there that's what we did in the olden days where you have header.html and you just have a frame mm -hmm. set uh, so you can use the same header on every single website. Um, we're not going to do that, right? So you probably need some sort of way to template it out. And that might look like uh, either a server-side templating language uh, like like Pug or what are, what are the other ones that are really popular? Handlebars. What's the one that? EJS Blade? was one. What does Laravel use? Laravel. Blade. Blade. Yeah. Yeah, do you remember EJS? Did you ever use that one? Yeah, yeah, I used that one. Yeah, EJS was really popular before. It was. I think it was for Django, right? Did, is that what it was used? I remember it being used in like um, JavaScript MVC before, like mm. Backbone got popular. There was yeah. this thing called JavaScript MVC that you used that to template everything out. But you can also choose a front end framework. Probably most of you listen to this podcast. Due to the type of person that listens to this podcast, you're going to reach for uh, either like React or Svelte or a framework, Remix, Next, Svelte Kit, uh, any of the number of other frameworks that are out there. And that is going to both aid you in doing all of your routing, handling your image assets, as well as templating out, making reusable components so that you can use things like your header, your footer, your newsletter, subscribe throughout your entire application yeah and it, you can also just use straight up html you know i mean html yeah. is a a language that's made for this type of thing it's scaffolding out things and whether or not that's being developed on the server side Let, i mean let's take into account your most basic website your most basic website could straight up just be five pages those five pages have some information on them it's not going to change you could be the type of person who says, oh, let me build that in one of these fancy front end frameworks and then spit it out to be a static site. Or you might be the person that says, hey, you know what? I'm just going to keep it as simple as possible. Use no JavaScript unless I need it for anything. Maybe I'm building, I mean, heck, you can build carousels now with CSS. So you can remain as little JavaScript as possible as you want on this thing. Did I tell you what I did for my <laughs> what website? <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you where I'm at with my my course platform right now is so my course platform is not the actual like there's a couple parts to it. Um, the back end is is a, a React application. It's all dynamic and it's server or cl client rendered and that's all like a fun React app. But the actual like marketing websites um, those are vanilla JavaScript and HTML. 
right? Yeah. And I've been using, for many, many years, I've been using Pug to template out those pages because it worked well. I can do things like loop over the videos and render out a list of videos. You can create reusable components. I can share throughout all the marketing websites. And like I've sort of reached like the end of that being what I want to do for the next one. Mm. Um, and I, I probably eventually I would like to get it, the entire thing onto like a, a framework like Next.js or Svelte Kit or something like that. But it's not really something I want to do just yet. So like I'm kind of in this in-between area. So what I did is I am building my next course website in React, but I'm just I'm just using React for the ability to be a template engine. <laughs> mm. Meaning that like like I'm not using any of the like client rendering or whatever. I'm simply just using it so I can write all of my components and I can compile them in and then I just use React dot render to string on the server html yeah and then just spit out html because i don't i don't yeah. need any of the client side stuff but i also want to look a little future facing being like well i probably will write this in react at some point or i'll write it in some component based framework so if i'm going to be doing a little bit of work on a new website it's much easier to write it in jsx and and do all the loops and everything that i'm used to um, and then that way, when it comes time to rewrite this thing, I, I won't have to change that one from mm. Pug into yeah. React. So it's it, I wrote a whole template. Like Express has this idea of like a template engine. And I wrote my own template engine, which yeah, was yeah. a React <laughs> template engine. <laughs> hey, you know what? We did something very similar on Level Up before we moved to SvelteKit. When I was moving from Meteor to without Meteor, step yeah. one is what I did is I had the server just straight up returning React rendered to string. And yeah. then I then took that and was, in fact, rehydrating it on the client. But, you know, people look at these frameworks and they say, I got to use Next.js. I got to... You could, you could just return that React and then rehydrate it if you want. You can do all that yourself. It's not the most fun. <laughs> I think yeah. the rehydrating part is where it gets to be less fun. But if you... Like you're saying, I mean, you can take that code pipe it through a function essentially and get html out of there and in fact uh that's kind of what you're doing with server-side rendering react you just have a rehydrating step and you can do it with svelte you can do it with view you can do it with any of these things and it works really well um so definitely definitely an option there if you're the type of person who, who doesn't need that client side stuff and you, and you do like working in these componentized ways or yeah. heck if you like working in componentized manners you can just straight up use web components as well here either way we're getting into the weeds here basically yeah. you just need a way of authoring your structure for your page and you can largely choose to do that whether or not it is in a front end javascript framework in an HTML, any sort of way whatsoever, you need a way to structure your HTML to get it on the page. Now, how do you build and test these components? Well, you could have a couple options for building these components. You can just throw them on a page and have them in context. And this works well if you're trying to move fast, right? I'm maybe already hitting a database. I have the data ready to go, or perhaps it is fake data, or perhaps it is temporary data that is real but not final. Either way, you're working on these components in context of where of which they will live on the website. I'm designing a header. Hey, it's going to go in the header of the website, and I'm going to see it in action. There's another way of working on components, though, and that's in isolation. And in isolation is something that you would see in libraries like Storybook. Um, Storybook or history are the way that types of way people do things. And in fact, another way that's kind of underlooked is something that I do sometimes. I just put them in a div and make that div resizable. And then I can just see that div resizable. Now, Storybook offers way more features in terms of, you know, interactively passing props and having all your knobs and widgets and, and tests and stuff in there as well. But Mm -hmm. For the most part, the idea of building them in place versus in isolation means that in isolation, you can see a component and you can test it in various different ways, different container sizes, uh, different contexts, making sure it works as long as the data gets passed into it correctly. You can really fine tune that component. In my experience, working in isolation 
works much better on long-term big projects. If you're building out a big project, it has a lot of components, has multiple people working on it. Docu- you need to document those things. Yeah. You need to make sure that they work in various use cases. Working in isolation makes a lot of sense. If you are working on a website and it's just a website, you and your buddies or just you are going to be working on, there's there's no need to add Storybook to that thing or that type of flow. It's just going to slow you down. Totally. I at, For the Syntax website, we have like a show card component. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when you visit the syntax website, there's like a big one for the latest episode and it's black. And then you have, um, a grid of two by five or whatever of the latest show cards. And then when you go to the shows page, that's also the show card, right? Because they, they look a little bit different and they act a little bit different. Um, but they are primarily the same card. So when I was working on those cards, it was nice to be able to have all of them on a single page. And say, okay, well, I'm I'm making a change to the card, and I want to be I want to make sure that I'm not goofing it up for light or dark mode, mm-hmm. or these different situations where they might be right, like where where it's really wide or really small, especially because we are using container queries. So you're trying to size that big number. Uh, you want to make sure, oh, make sure it doesn't go too big, and make sure it doesn't go too small. And there's a lot of tricky trickiness when you get into those components that can literally live anywhere um and if that's the case building in them in isolation or at least just having a page where you dump every yeah. possible instance of them yeah so you can see them all at once and you, you're not like playing whack-a-mole where you change one thing and you go oh shoot that that broke it on this instance yeah and, and that's a whole thing and people often feel like if i want to test these things or look at them in isolation i now have to bring in some other dependency or and that's the whole thing with storybook it, it's its own process it's its own whole entire app that runs within your app you don't got to do that if you don't want to uh, we have two pages on the the syntax website that are live that you can see and they're sloppy because we're they're just there for our own personal use but we made this stuff public right um forward slash syntax.fm forward slash components and forward slash theme are two kind of dumping grounds that i made to dump things in to test them the the forward slash components is a page where i just can throw any single component in and it will show it narrow it will show it wide it will show it extra wide and then show it in a movable container that even outputs the width of the container so i can see and test directly and this these are just like quick little things i also have like an inverse section as well and then the forward slash themes allows me to see a component in all the different themes so that way if you want to test something out and see how it adapts to different themes yeah yeah i use this stuff all the time but you don't need fancy tooling for this you can just go ham yeah i also um on the colors page i need to fix this because it's slammed up against your colors but i i wrote a component that um pulled the computed variables off the html document so like any variables you put on root i was having trouble trying to figure out um what they actually were computed wise, you know, if you use calc Mm. or clamp or anything like that. Um, So I wrote a little component that grabbed them all off of the HTML document and then Mm. just dumped them in here. And it was nice to be able to see it. It's kind of interesting. Like some of them, when you use calc on a number, (laughs) the value is computed, but when you use calc for like, sometimes when you use calc, like with a percentage, it's not, all the way computed i don't know what the like where is the line where the browser will give you the computed value of actually what it's implementing and and where does it just give you the the actual calc uh sometimes sometimes you get one and sometimes you get another i wonder if at property the uh, css typing uh like houdini aspect of css yeah. came into play i wonder if that changes things at all because that allows you to define a variable as a type. I wonder if that yeah. affects how it's calculated. We need better dev tools for CSS variables because there's because yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, it's a mess. And like Chrome's are slightly better. Like if you hover over a variable in Chrome, they will often tell you the computed value, whereas Firefox will often just show you what it points to. Like if we have primary pointing to yellow and yellow points to yellow three, um. That's a lot of work for to figure out what actually is it though. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I would love, love some better dev tools that would follow these um, values a little bit further. 
and, and yeah. show you where they were defined and what they're pointing to and how they're calculated. Yeah, imagine you hover over one and it would show you like a, like a tree or something. Yeah. This connects to this, connects to this. I don't know. Come on. Like, it, it's funny. Like, you see that the dev tools went all out on Flexbox and Grid dev tools. Totally. But CSS variables are kind of meh, not a whole lot of data. Anyways, we're just complaining here. Let's keep talking about <laughs> uh, building stuff. Uh, real data or fake data is is a really good question. I like to go with real data as much as possible. Yes. If you have it available, right? And that's nice because you can you can use the actual data that's coming in. But sometimes, like I even know Polypane has a has a feature for this. Is sometimes you don't think about German last names or or mm -hmm. other things like that. So it can be useful to have some data that is outside of what you think. What happens when you have a really short title? What happens when you have extremely long last name that cannot break in between? All those little edge cases are, are helpful to hit as well. I also find with uh, GitHub Copilot or any of these AI things, they are very good at generating a bunch mm -hmm. of random mm -hmm. data. And that will often make your deving experience when you don't have the back end hooked up just yet much better because you don't have to like, oh, like I always use Wes, Scott, and all of our dogs' names as examples. And like, I'm sick of that, you know? Like I want some other examples, <laughs> I but I, too, yeah. I can't possibly think of other people's names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I started going to kids and family members. Yeah. I, you know, but if you have a data schema, that's a good point. If you even have your data schema or you have a general idea of your data schema, or you can just even write like a like a really quick rough data schema, copy and paste that, send it into an AI tool and say, hey, give me a hundred of these things. Um, if you have that, if you have that structure for it to output, it's pretty reliable at getting you something like that. If not, you can um, do some work to get you some fake data really quickly. There's also tools like Faker or some of these things that they get you data fast, but you know, you don't need to install a dependency to get some fake data, especially if it's just temporary. But I 100% agree. If you have the ability to have real data, get that real data, or at least if it's temporary or short data, get that in there. Making up fake data entirely only works if that fake data has variety. A number one thing that you see with inexperienced designers is they'll give you a mock-up and they'll have like nine cards or something. And all nine cards will have the exact same title that are the same length, right? They don't go on to two lines. None of them go on yeah. to three lines or whatever. They have no plan. If you have if you have two lines of text, their entire design goes out the window. They 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 just don't have that experience, right? So being able to set yourself up for success there will make sure that when you actually do use real data, that you don't end up having an oopsie daisy. Now all of a sudden, I have to deal with line height, and it looks bad. What do I do? Yeah, I when I was doing the uh, open graph cards, I was doing mm -hmm. a little bit of design to the sizing and. What I did is I just had a browser open with 15 of them uh, because <laughs> like you need as many possible podcast titles. Some of the podcast titles are like 400 characters and some of them are eight characters. So being able to account for all of those. And also sometimes designers will just like make up things like uh, <laughs> they'll be like, it's a six minute read. And yeah. it's like, well. We don't have the infrastructure to yeah. do that. Like, where we are you getting this data? data? So yeah. don't design things around or or maybe do. Maybe force those lazy back-end devs to actually give you that data. But <laughs> sometimes people are just start throwing in, uh, throwing in. Like, for example, on some of our stuff, I wanted to list the number of words that were spoken in every single episode. <laughs> um, and we could do that because it would have to be done at a database level but if if it wasn't if those words were not queryable by the database and you had yeah. to like select them all and then loop over and count them then that would be a big pain in the ass and probably slow the site down more than it's 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 worth yeah and that's funny because some designers might look at that and say it's no big deal you have the words why don't you just count them yeah and you're like well <laughs> let me tell you because the way to do that efficiently would be involve having to write a database process that then we got yeah, to also you're indexing things that you didn't index before exactly so let's talk about that data so now that we're talking yeah. about fake data or real data let's talk about database um and your data now the big question is do you need a content management system or not 
hey, a content management system essentially is there in place so that non-technical folks can add and update content without having to get into Markdown. Don't ask your non-technical folks to make a GitHub account and publish Markdown changes. Then they got to learn what a PR is. No, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's never going to work. So if you have non-technical folks who need to update your content, you most likely either one will need a CMS or two, you will need to be comfortable writing that back end piece. And that back end piece has a lot of moving components to it. Now, these types of things are made a lot easier if you're using a system like Django or Rails, these types of things that can scaffold out these pages for you. Yeah. But those are like kind of one step in between a fully custom and a CMS, right? So if you need a CMS that's full featured, hey, that puts you in a very specific territory. All right, now I need a CMS. I got to start thinking what types of things do I need out of my CMS and which CMS do I need? Or likewise, if I feel comfortable making this all custom myself, which by all accounts, I've done it many times. It works fine if you if you want to do it that way. What type of database do you need? And yeah, honestly, uh, the database conversation is interesting. People get really, really passionate about which databases they choose and which databases they like to work in. Do you even need a database? A database is great if you want to save data and retrieve data, update data, have that data be available later. If you just have straight up static content on a website, you might not need a database at all. Let me tell you, I will do things to avoid using a database because yeah. having a database instantly adds a massive amount of complexity to your app. So you have to consider that as well. Do I really need this database should be a question that you ask yourself. I find myself whenever I'm just playing around with features. Like when I was doing the early work for the AI and transcript stuff, mm -hmm. I was simply just saving JSON files to disk. Yeah. Um, and then I, I wrote a little function that just said like get or set, <laughs> I, or you could, you could even, if I were to go one step further, I would probably reach for SQLite, light SQ light. Um, because that is a database that simply just sits as a text file in your folder. There's no, like, you don't have to run processes. There's no SQLite server. Um, it simply just sits. And a lot of the adapters that you might end up using, um, Prisma, SQLize. Uh, what's the other one that everyone's talking about? Drizzle. Does Drizzle use SQLite? No, no. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Drizzle does SQLite. So I might even reach for that because although you might not use SQLite or SQLite, uh, you might be able to make use of a ORM like Drizzle or Prisma or SQLize. Um, and then you can switch to it without having to rewrite any queries. But honestly, ain't nothing wrong with <laughs> sticking stuff into a text file yeah. on your on your computer. Yeah, I know people often want to go high tech for their solutions, right? Because it feels like, hey, that's how I'm supposed to do it. But really, do you remember the, the static file C CMS was a big thing for a little bit. Statamic was one of those. Bolt was another one. Do you remember the static file CMS, Wes? That yeah. was a trend in CMSs for a little bit. Yeah. And that, but basically those would just write to file, right? Like They're Tina all, CMS all writing. Is similar to that. It, you, it's more than that, but like you can edit it via this nice UI and then it will save to like wherever your adapter says, like GitHub would be a good example. Thinking of this in the same regard, Wes, I'm going to yeah. ask you to go to this Statamic website, which is a static file CMS that we used to use. And let me just look at this design aesthetic. It is very syntax in a positive way. Oh, yeah, this is uh, Jack McDade. He does a bunch yeah. of cool stuff. But yeah, big fan of this design style. Yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, oh, I just clicked on the deer. <laughs> Click the deer on the Statamic website. It just There's says, I promise if that tickle, I would not tell you. <laughs> I would not tell you. Uh... Um, speaking of CMSs, we haven't talked about CMSs on the show in a while. Um, mostly because there are so many out there. We did a roundup about a year, year and a half ago. Um, but, and I, I keep getting emails from literally every single person that works on a, a CMS. Uh, Strappy, Tina, Payload, uh, Sanity, Prismic, lots of open source ones, lots of paid ones. 
Uh, if you, the listener, want more CMS content, or if you want like a rundown, or if you want us to have like four people from these different CMSs on to talk about us, let us know. Because I don't know if people are just exhausted by all the CMSs choices out there, or if they're hungry for more. Yeah, the the hard part about CMSs is, is just like, well, there's all these options, or there's just good old WordPress that has everything yeah. you could possibly want. Exactly. Actually, well, I, maybe that's a, a bit of a, a next one, is choosing a backend language or a framework. Does your backend language or framework also dictate how you will do your front end? In some cases, the answer to that is, is yes. Like WordPress is a good example. If you are choosing WordPress as a CMS, um, of course, you can do headless WordPress, but if you're choosing WordPress, you probably want a lot of the plugins and the whole ecosystem that sort of goes along with WordPress, right? And if that's the case, then you sort of have a lot of these decisions already made for you, right? Like, how do you make components? Well, you you have PHP files uh, that are on there. Like, what database are you using? Well, you're using MySQL. What, are you using an ORM? Yeah, you're probably using WP Query uh, to pull that sort of stuff out what backend language are you using php for sure that's mm -hmm. the only language that that runs in i would go as far as saying if you are backend experienced <laughs> you should probably pick your backend first and if you're front end experienced yeah you should probably pick your front end first and then let that dick that let that choice dictate where you want to go right i i'm like react React guy, I want to I want to use React for this, no doubt. Okay, well then your best options are probably Remix, Astro, or Next.js, right? So from there, that kind of dictates what you're using. And mm -hmm. likewise, if I'm a you know if if I'm primarily a a PHP dev, well then that is going to dictate. Uh, okay, well shoot, well I guess I'm going to be using WordPress, and I can do so headlessly with JavaScript, or I can do so with WordPress's templating system, or I can do so with Laravel and go straight up Laravel. And in my mind, I think that is like a good way to optimize working on this stuff is to pick the thing that you are most confident and comfortable in and work from there, whether that is a back end or a front end. And likewise, I, I use I like Svelte. So I pick Svelte kit, right? Would I would I have picked something else? If I wanted to work in Svelte, probably not, right? It just makes sense to use the thing that's the easiest to use in that regard. Um, for options, I, like I mentioned, if you want to work in JavaScript, there's a lot of different options for backends. You have uh, Next.js, Remix, Astro, Svelte, Kit, Nuxt. I'm sure there's many more. There's Solid State, those types of things. PHP, WordPress, Laravel, Ruby. Rails seems like, honestly, the best option if you're like, if, if you want to work in Ruby and you don't want to build your website in Rails, you're probably an experienced Rubyer, right? Um, yeah. Python and uh, there's Flask and Django are like the two big ones there. Either way, most of the kind of tooling or framework system or backend systems have kind of like happy paths for the way that you build a site with those paths. I, I would say like it, I was, if you're listening to this and you're like really not sure about any of this type of stuff, I would probably say your go to right now was be pick one of the big meta frameworks out there in React world. There's Next.js or Remix. Um, in Svelte land, there's Svelte Kit. In Vue land, there is Nuxt. And uh, then you could also look into something like Astro, which is kind of, you can use a, a bunch of the different ones. I'm that pretty are bullish there. on Astro right now, folks. It's if you want thing. If you want to go someplace that has a lot of simplicity and you can pick your own front-end framework, hey, yeah. Astro's where it's at. It's pretty sick. T take a look at it. But basically, these the, you'll hear this word thrown around a lot is a meta framework. And essentially what that means is you're, you're taking your rendering library, React or Svelte or Vue, mm -hmm. um, but then you you probably also need like a server, right? So they'll give you the ability to create serverless functions that will handle things like API requests and connecting to databases and returning data, a lot of Send those email. nice things, sending emails, things like that. Um, and then you probably also want like a router, right? And then uh, maybe you want like a like an image resizing processor. So those don't generally come with meta frameworks, but there's there's one built into every, like there's an adapter for all of these different frameworks out there. So that's probably our go-to, especially if you're a big fan of JavaScript, TypeScript, is take one of those meta frameworks and, and run with it and then figure out what CMS do I want to tack onto this? How do I want to write my CSS? 
and how how do I want to design this type of thing? Word. Yeah. Yeah. Once you've really kind of nailed down that, you could just pick your tools and start start going with it. Um, I think the next thing would be like you'd actually have some things down to 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 code, right? You you've worked on your site, you have it working to some degree, you understand what you're using for bits and pieces of it. You you have at least something on the page and maybe you want to start testing it. Some people are like crazy about testing where they want to do test driven design. They want to test each individual function at any given point. They want to test every single unit of your site and that's called unit testing, right? You have any individual function, that function is getting tested, right? And yeah. for unit testing, each of these languages probably have their own happy path for testing. Any kind of situation you're going to find yourself in, you'll find people talking about what is the specific way of testing. Now, my humble opinion is that unless you're you're working on big time stuff, you probably don't need a lot of unit tests unless you're working on a big, big time app because that can really get in the weeds again you're having to get into really language specific tooling for testing. And maybe you're very comfortable with that stuff and that's fine. But if you're not, the easiest way, if you want to test anything, is to use end-to-end -end testing libraries like Cypress or Playwright. These two things are basically, they don't matter. It doesn't matter if you're writing your app in JavaScript, Django, Ruby on Rails, PHP, whatever. These things literally open up your website in a headless browser and then run JavaScript on that page to implement clicks and then tests to make sure that things are where they should be, meaning that they don't care how you built your app. And that, to me, is extremely valuable. One time, I rewrote <laughs> Level Up Tutorials from React.js to Svelte and did not change a single end-to-end -end test. I knew that when my end-to-end -end test passed that I was good, but I didn't have to change my tests. Can you imagine? I changed the language yeah. entirely. So that's the one <laughs> reason I don't love really, really tightly scoped testing libraries within the web space. Now, it makes sense in other spaces where you're not going to ever do that. And granted, most people won't ever change large aspects of your site. But having something that uses it the same way a user does inside of a browser is extremely handy yeah that makes a lot of sense if you think about like your user clicking a button playing a podcast um with those types of things you want to make sure that when somebody clicks on a show they go to that page when somebody clicks on a play button that the audio loads and when they push a a show note timestamp, it skips to that value right and if those if, if we were to literally change the entire tech stack the end user probably doesn't care no, that we right. change any of the tech stack, but they that's why, like you said, testing for the actual features and that it actually works in the browser when it's all put together um, makes a lot of sense. There's actually one one thing somebody asked on Twitter the other day is how would you test that? And I, I, I thought this was really interesting. The syntax website, I implemented uh, media source, which was when you play a podcast on the syntax website and then you lock your phone, what shows up mm -hmm. on your lock screen Jeez. is is defined. I didn't even know that this was an API, um, but it shows up and you can define the album art, the name of the podcast, um, what happens when somebody presses the skip 10 seconds buttons and back 10 seconds. So you have, you have control over quite a bit of that. And uh, I was somebody was asking, like, how do you test that, right? Like... <laughs> once you implement it and you can unit test it really easily, right? You can, you can click on a play button and then you check for the metadata that has been set on the window. So I think it's like navigator.mediasources.metadata. You can check if the object is what you're expecting, right? That, that's a unit test, mm -hmm. but uh, the integration test, how do you test the lock? You could do that in end to end too. How, well, I'm, but, I'm sorry, you couldn't test specifically if the lock screen had the information on it, but you could check that metadata because you have access to JavaScript. To the DOM, You're yeah, just, you could do yeah. that in end-to-end -end test, but you couldn't, I, I guess, when things go outside of, I guess yes. same thing with like a webcam, you know, like when things go outside totally. of the browser into the the actual system, that gets a little trickier. So You manually I answered, test it there. <laughs> yeah. How do you test it? 
You play a show, you lock your screen, you look at it with your eyeballs. <laughs> you ask yes. your friend with an Android to try it too. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, let's talk about uh, hosting the thing. Um, now the question is, where do you host it? How do you host it? Uh, do you want, like hosting itself has sort of ballooned to these services. They're called passes, platform as a service. Um, and it, it involves so much more than the actual server, right? It, it, it contains continuous integration. So you make a Git commit, you push the Git commit up. Um, it's going to run a build, make sure the thing builds. It might run your tests, make sure all your tests pass. Um, it might run some GitHub actions to fire off a bunch of different things that need to happen. Um, so that is part of your deployment. Um, it will also handle scaling. So you get a ton of traffic. You don't do you have to handle the load balancer yourself or mm -hmm. um, will your your service do it? So on a lot of my hosting platforms, I'll just set a limit to how high this thing can scale. And if I all of a sudden get a whole bunch of traffic, it'll just scale up to multiple instances. Um, CDN, that's a, that's a big one, is if you've got images or, or HTML pages on there that you want to cache around the world, does it include a CDN or do you have to configure that yourself? So um a kind of interesting blog post the other day from Lee, who is um, developer relations at Vercel. And like Vercel gets a lot of flack for Next.js not doing all the vercel -y things on other hosting platforms, right? Um, and he, he's kind of like, yeah, like you can host it and, and it, we support all of that. But like Vercel is a lot more than just hosting, right? Like it's a CDN. It's a load balancer. It's a cache invalidator. Uh, it's a, a scaler. It scales up. And a lot of that is infrastructure. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting take at that whole argument that you hear over and over again. Yeah. And, and honestly, like, <laughs> one thing you got to ask yourself with the entirety of this episode, I'm talking about uh, uh, tip to tail here. Do you? Do you need all this stuff? Because <laughs> yes. you just list off, oh, you got a CDN and a load balancer and server. Like, no, you don't need all this stuff. If you want to write a website in 2023 and beyond, you just need HTML and CSS straight up. It One thing I think gets lost in this conversation about websites being too complex nowadays or there being too much stuff to do. Yeah you don't have to do all that stuff. People put building a website like Netflix or Facebook in the exact same bucket as scott.com or, you know, whatever my at Talin, .ski, my website, right? Those are not even remotely similar to these same type of projects. Could I write my website, personal website with HTML and CSS straight up? Yes, it will work fine. Could I drag it to a shared hosting plan on FTP and have it work the same way I did in, in 2005? Yes, you can do that as well. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. If you have requirements to make these things work faster, work more globally, work in a more interactive or crazy ways, <laughs> then... Yeah you get into situations where you need more of this stuff. So I can just, I, I hear people all the time complaining, it's too complex, you got too much stuff, whatever. Yes, but also you don't need all that stuff. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. There's a, there's a whole spectrum of different types of projects we're working on here. So if you're the type of person who's listening to all of this and thinking, gosh, I really don't feel like I need all this stuff. Hey, perhaps you don't. Yeah. I, one thing I love about Netlify as a host is they have this netlify.com forward slash drop and you literally drag and drop your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and boom, at the about. other end, you get a URL for it, which is like the most incredibly simple thing ever, right? Like that's that's even easier than having to pay for a FTP host and then SSH into it and figure out how to drag and drop your files up to it. So big fan that's probably the easiest way to get something online or like one of these glitch code sandbox something like that 
code pen where you can just write the code in the editor and get it going. Yeah. Easy peasy, right? Yes. So that is how you build a website <laughs> or an app. It's kind of interesting to see what people's approaches to this type of thing are and all the different choices that you need. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Let us know what you do. Tweet us at Syntax FM. Sick. All right, let's move into some sick picks. You got a sick pick for me today? Oh, yeah. I got a sick pick. And uh, this thing is kind of a literal pick because it's not like a nice pick, but it's going to pick stuff for you. I don't know. Ooh. I don't know if that even works at all. Uh, because what it is, it's a chip clip. It's a chip clip. I guess it doesn't really pick things. But, hey, um, chip clips. You know them. You love them. You got to have them. One thing that Courtney and I are always struggling to do is to find a chip clip when we need a dang chip clip <laughs> so yeah i bought a 20 pack of metal chip clips for it was like 15 bucks when i got them looks like it's 16 bucks now these heavy duty chip clips these things are basically you know they're, they're clamps they're little metal clamps they work really well they're, they're just you, you get 20 of them so you got you got one when you need one either way awesome doesn't That's doesn't nice. matter which one you get just mass get a bunch of chip clips toss them in a tupperware container in a drawer or something that way when you got it you're not just wrinkling up that bag and hoping that the air doesn't get in oh these look nice yeah we have the like ikea ones that you have to like lock I'm not a fan of those oh yeah and also plastic chip clips they don't last straight up you no might think they you're don't going cheap they they break over time uh, every chip yeah. plastic chip clip i've ever had is broken over time <laughs> uh i am going to sick pick a toilet seat so hear me out for a second <laughs> this better be some I, toilet seat wes yeah uh, this is going to be the uh intersection of good deals and improve life improvement here hey please um, don't tell me you got this at a garage sale uh, close enough. Um, <laughs> so, uh, our house, our house that we moved into doesn't have soft closed toilet seats and mm. I, our old house did. So often I'll just hit the toilet seat to close it and slam, oh, you know, yeah. middle of the night, shake the whole house, super yep. loud, wake up the dog, soft closed toilet seat is the best. Um, and I've been wanting to do it for a long time, change all the toilets in our house over. But like our, our toilets are like this weird color that is, is hard to find. Right. And I thought, okay, so finally, after one day of slamming it, I was like, you know what? I'm going to figure out what color this toilet actually is. <laughs> I did the research and I found it. And then like, I went to look for one and they're, they're like 80 bucks for a toilet seat. I was like, there's no chance yeah. I'm going to do it until I discovered the used toilet seat. No. <laughs> Hear me out. So toilet seats come in hundreds of different colors. So Amazon is full of toilet seats that have been returned because they're not the same color. And who in their right mind would ever buy a used toilet seat off of Amazon? Me. Not going to be me. me. <laughs> because I knew... <laughs> That oh. people are buying them on Amazon. It's not the right color. I'm going to return it. So I rolled the dice and said, I'm buying a used toilet seat on Amazon for 18 bucks versus 80. Ordered three of them. They all showed up brand new, still in the package, still sealed. All the people do is they cut it open. They pull it out and they go, oh, that's not the right color. Put it back in the box. Send it back to Amazon. It ends up as a used toilet seat on Amazon. So I go into the warehouse section on amazon find the toilet seat boom got the nicest soft clothes uh toilet seats for 18 bucks uh so hot tip obviously there's a slight chance you might get a used toilet seat in the mail which is maybe wear a pair of gloves but like come on that's a good deal <laughs> i'm gonna be real with you every everything that you've said makes perfectly fine sense <laughs> It makes, I get it. Yeah. But the, the emotional part of me says, hell no, I am not buying yeah. a uh, a used toilet seat regardless. Off the internet? <laughs> yeah. Valid, valid. But uh, for my friends who like a good deal, let me, I'll put you onto that. So yeah. let me know if you, if you do that. 
Anyways, okay. that's it for today. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We will catch you on Friday. Peace. Peace.